Chapter 12. Canon Law. The term, quote, canon law, end quote, has an unpleasant sound in modern ears. It connotes the, quote unquote, tyranny of the church, the Middle Ages, oppression, and much else of the same ilk. In truth, however, the concept of canon law means liberty. It is often assumed that Calvin was a strong enemy of canon law. In the Institutes 6.10, Calvin dealt with, quote, The power of legislation, in which the Pope and his adherents have most cruelly tyrannised over the minds and tortured the bodies of men, end quote. But Calvin did not have true canon law in mind, but the perversions of it, quote, Whatever edicts have been issued by men respecting the worship of God, independently of his word, it has been customary to call human tradition, end quote. Of, quote, human laws, end quote, that is, laws having no warrant in the word of God, Calvin said, quote, If they are designed to introduce any scruple into our minds, as though the observance of them were essentially necessary, we assert that they are unreasonable impositions on the conscience. For our consciences have to do not with men, but with God alone, end quote. Man has no need to add to God's law because, quote, Everything pertaining to the perfect rule of a holy life, the Lord has comprehended in his law, so that there remains nothing for men to add to that summary, end quote. The, quote, sole legislator, end quote, is God, and men cannot lawfully assume this honour to themselves. Calvin's hostility was not to the canon law as such, but to the abuses of it. Calvin saw himself simply uh, trying to restore the rule of true canon law. Canon law, in its true sense, means not only the liberty of the church, but the liberty of man and society. To understand the implications of canon law, it is necessary to realise that ancient society was unitary and it had a single, visible human sovereignty. It was totalitarian in practice and in faith. A visible, quote-unquote, divine authority governed the whole of life and admitted the existence of no independent order. For the ancient state, the uncontrolled was the enemy, and the controlled was the subject. Neither man nor any of his activities and institutions possessed any free, uncontrolled or independent domains wherein the state had no jurisdiction. The sovereignty of the state meant that man was the creature of the state and entirely its subject. But biblical faith asserted instead the sovereignty of God and the ultimacy of his decree and law, so that man, the state and every institution were under God and his law. Instead of the sovereign state providing the overall shelter for all things, the sovereign God is that overlord, and all of man's institutions are directly under God and his word. Instead of a mediatorial state, Christ is man's mediator. The Bible provides a legal mandate for the institutions, and the state is made the ministry of justice, and the church the ministry of the word and the sacraments. The family is under God's law, as is agriculture, commerce, science, education, and all things else. Neither the church nor the state nor any other institution has a legitimate overall power of control. But the state in antiquity and again today has played the overall role of God, the sovereign over every realm and with basic and ultimate power over every realm. The state can permit or grant to its children or creatures certain privileges, but it cannot tolerate their denial of its sovereign authority. For the church, therefore, to issue canons placing Christians under the canons of Christ, under the laws of God, was a denial of the sovereignty of the state and of its canons. It was a shattering of the concept of the totalitarian unitary state. Calvin had no desire to destroy canon law, therefore, but rather to restore the true canon or rule, the word of God, to Geneva. The independence of the church required it. Political absolutism, however, then as now, has been hostile to canon law. Instead of the multiple law orders and multiple variety of courts which characterised the era of Christian feudalism, absolutism in the state has worked steadily to reduce all human society to one law order 
the state. Every other realm must be subjected to the state rather than to God, the church, economics, science, education, agriculture, the arts. All things are made aspects of the life of the state rather than of man under God and therefore under the government of the state. The supposition of the state in its absolutism is twofold. First, by asserting overall sovereignty and jurisdiction, the state is usurping the power and prerogative of God. The state makes itself the ultimate creator and lawgiver rather than God. Second, the state declares itself to be the true man as well as the true God. Every God-given aspect of the life of man, the state declares both to be its creation and also an aspect of its life. When the state makes religion, economics, science, education, agriculture, the arts, and all other law spheres aspects of its life, it is denying that it is one among many law spheres in which man operates and claims instead to be the overall governor of the law spheres, and also the state claims to be the true man for whom these law spheres exist, to serve the state and to further its dominion. The state by this says in effect, the true man is the state, so that man is not truly man outside the state. This faith was common to antiquity. The destruction of the concept of canon law is necessary for the success of totalitarianism. The state cannot rule absolutely unless it can reduce man to a single law sphere, the state, and deny valid jurisdiction to every other law sphere. This destruction has largely been accomplished and in every branch of the church, canon law is not only overlaid with human tradition, but is also regarded as a relic of the past. Man's true law sphere is seen as the state. In the political sphere, man must realize the good life and true brotherhood and the world's hope is in politics. When Pope Paul VI, on Monday, October the 4th, 1965, appeared before the United Nations to make his plea for a peaceful world order, he in effect abandoned canon law in that he saw, as a saving order and man's true order, not the transcendental kingdom of God, but an imminent and united world order. Speaking as, quote, the pontiff of Rome and, quote, the bearer of a message for all mankind, end quote, he said that this was his message. Quote, we might call our message a ratification, a solemn moral ratification of this lofty institution, end quote, that is, the United Nations. Since the United Nations claims worldwide jurisdiction and since the UN reduces all religions to a level of equality by prohibiting any discrimination with respect to creed, the Pope's speech in effect declared that the true kingdom is the UN's kingdom of man, and rather than defending Christ's declaration of the supremacy of his kingdom over all realms and institutions, John 19.11, Matthew 26.64, the Pope reduced the kingdom Christ may possess to an adjunct of man's kingdom. The social gospel is likewise a denial of canon law. It sees a one undivided realm, the state, as the true order of God and man. The state is given the overall jurisdiction and sovereignty over church, school, family and business, farming and all things else, which belongs only to God. The essential function of the social gospel is to render all things unto Caesar and nothing to God. True canon law is the application of the canon or rule of scripture to the problems of life. Pelicia said of the word canon that, quote, Writers of Roman history used, end quote, the term, quote, to describe a muster roll of soldiers and their commissariat, end quote. Truly, biblical canons are the muster roll of defenders of the faith, protectors of the faithful, and applications of scripture to the problems of the day. When canons are restricted to the formal polity of the church and say nothing concerning the application of doctrine to the problems of the world, the real function of the canon law is lost and nothing but an ecclesiastical Robert's Rules of Order remains. When, for example, churches pass resolutions supporting civil violence, equalitarianism, community organisation for picketing and demonstrations, 
They are clearly violating the biblical law and are moving in terms of human traditions. A false canon or rule has then been applied to life, a canon other than the infallible word of God. The application of a valid canon is apparent in a measure taken in 1966 by a church in Wisconsin, unfortunately, however, destined to be neglected. The measure in question specified the problem and applied God's law to it. Quote, the Council of the Racine Christian Reformed Church overtures Classis Wisconsin to Overture Synod 1 to reaffirm its decision as articulated in the Acts of Synod 1912 regarding socialism, namely that it is an error and a departure from our principles. See Acts of Synod 1912, Article 47, page 38, which reads as follows, quote, The consistories shall take the same attitude towards such persons which they take over against all departures from our principles, end quote. A. Formal ground. This decision has been buried in oblivion and most of our leaders are totally unfamiliar with it. B. Material grounds. 1. Socialism is in conflict with man being the image bearer of God, who as such is a responsible creature who is individually accountable to God. The Christian may not shun any facet of his personal and covenantal God-ordained responsibilities by shifting them to the state. 2. Socialism is in conflict with the first commandment of the moral law in that it gives priority to the state above God as the supreme authority over man. God is the great benefactor and not the state. Socialism is the direct opposite of this, making the state the distributor of wealth and regulator of life. Men are then forced by circumstance to look to the state rather than to divine providence for the source of their daily material sustenance. 3. Socialism is in conflict with the Eighth Commandment of the Moral Law, which insists upon the legitimacy of private property, forbids any form of stealing said property, and demands of the individual faithful stewardship of such property. 4. Socialism is in conflict with the Tenth Commandment of the Moral Law, which forbids all coveting of the neighbour's possessions and all notions of status redistribution of wealth, which is the trumpeting position of socialism. 5. Socialism advances the idea of centralisation of power, which is the very purpose of Satan and of both the beasts out of the sea and the earths, as set forth in Revelation 13. Further, it advocates, quote, one world, end quote, which will certainly be under the Antichrist, which we may not advocate or support in any degree or form. 2. To do its utmost to disseminate the knowledge of this biblical position with grounds throughout the domination in the way that Synod believes to be the most effective. Grounds 1. Many Christian Reformed people are unaware of our ecclesiastical stand, which, as stated above, has been largely ignored and buried with the passage of time. 2. The gradual drift towards socialism and state welfareism in the United States and Canada has rendered us unconsciously vulnerable to the departure from these biblical principles. 3. The current accelerated adoption of socialist and state welfareist measures in the United States and Canada makes it a matter of paramount importance that our people be aware of our denominational position and see socialism for what it is, a diabolical evil. 3. To require of all our ministers, professors, teachers and denominational employees and all in positions of leadership that they be sincerely committed to our position, that they strictly adhere to this position in their church life and private conduct and that they faithfully champion this position and warn our constituency against all departures therefrom. Grounds 1. They have a great influence upon the membership of the Christian Reformed denomination. 2. They play a strategic role in the shaping and moulding of the future thinking of the membership of our denomination by virtue of the great influence which they exert upon our covenant youth. 3. They function as an important segment of the total Christian witness which God requires our denomination to bear in this veil of darkness. End quote. In such a statement, it is the word of God which provides the canon, not humanism, Greek philosophy or some other principle. 
Doivert has shown how Roman legal concepts essentially altered the medieval church's concept of canon law. From a biblically informed perspective, all things are subject to the laws of God. Every area of law is a sphere which is separate from others, so that a state has no right to interfere in the sphere of church, or, for example, in the arithmetical sphere. The laws of mathematics, as well as the laws of the church and of the state, are alike of God's creating, and no one sphere can arrogate to itself God's creative power and overall sovereignty. For the state to claim that it can rule over mathematics, the church, or economics, is to violate its mandate and to ensure social disaster. While the spheres have an interdependence in that not one is in any sense complete in itself or a living world by itself, this interdependence rests on their common creation by God to provide a world of possible liberty for man. Life is not numerics, nor is it the state, school, church, economics, science, or any one of the other spheres. And for one law sphere to attempt to provide the sovereignty and unity over all is to reduce man into slavery to a limited aspect of life. For man to be free, therefore, the canon law had to be applied as a regulative principle to limit man in his every sphere and relation. Canon law ceases to be truly canonical when it fails to place these limitations on man in his total activity. The law, then, has a canon other than scripture.